We're going over the good, the bad, and the ugly with the CBT Civil PE Reference Manual. Is there anything good in this thing? Are there some hidden gems that people haven't been talking about? We're gonna get to the bottom of all of that and I'm going to pick out what I believe to be the best sections to help you succeed at passing your PE exam. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We are trying to make structural engineering more accessible to others, easier to understand, and help you improve in your own industry and bring the important aspects of our work to the general population. Population. If all of that sounds good to you, consider subscribing down below. It's totally free and you can unsubscribe at any time, but we would all love to have you here as another engineer to help spread the word at what we do and why it's so important. Hopefully there's something beneficial in here that I believe will help you pass the PE exam. A main thing that is so important is actually understanding how the test is actually going to be uh, built basically and what provisions and materials they are going to be referencing from. Because this is now computer-based testing, there are new rules and new things to this that are kind of unknown because people really haven't been taking it yet. So at the very beginning here, you can see in the introduction, I would say read through this for yourself before you start diving head first and understand the information that they're trying to get across to you. Down below, you can see under other supplied exam materials that they get in and give links to lists of all those materials that they're gonna be referencing, codes, um, and as well as this PDF. Will it be exactly like this for you? Always check out the links that they give you and always check into, you know, right there, the nces.org homepage and check for updates all the time. Like pretty much weekly, I would say, check in to make sure things haven't changed while you're studying. Physically, you don't need to use a table of contents anymore. You can just, I'm pretty sure, use control F and type in your search word that you want and it will sort through. That's how it at least worked when I took my computer-based test for the FE exam. But for the sake of argument, say that control F doesn't work during the exam, table of contents is where you're gonna go. With all that said, we're starting here at chapter one where I believe this chapter has the most substantial amount of information that is critical for you to understand in order for you to pass your PE exam. It's general engineering and it starts off by giving you basically commonly used items throughout all of engineering, whether you're civil or any of the four subdisciplines in between, this is an area where you will all reference back to. Your conversion factors in section 1.2, I had this at the front of my big paper reference manual that I took into the exam, and I know that when I went through my studying, I was at this conversion table many, many, many times for many different types of practice problems. Section 1.3 gets into a lot of mathematics, but there's some key notes here that I want to point out for you. Trigonometry, SOHCAHTOA, these are your equations that to me, super beneficial and very important. And I know a lot of this stuff is simple. You have the area of a circle, you have the circumference of a circle, and you're like, I know that in my own head, I don't need to be told what it is. It's not about what you can cram into your head. It's about keeping your mind clear on the bigger picture items. And then for the little miscellaneous things in between, easy equations, stuff like that, forget about it. Let uh, the PDF do the horsework for you. Moving on from there, we have section 1.5, statics. Need I go on? Of course you need this. You can even see they have uh, statically determinate trusses and they give you the two methods in order to solve for this. Unfortunately, this is a little vague. They give you method of joints and then they say, or you can use method of sections, um, but they don't really give you any example or figures to talk about that at all. And I think that's kind of a letdown. Uh, trying to describe in words those two methods is, is pretty difficult. And for someone who isn't familiar with it can get lost pretty easily. So. Uh, don't rely too much on this PDF, in my opinion, if you're getting into trusses. And then on page 24, this is a big one. Everything we kind of just talked about in terms of volumes and areas and everything in between uh, is summarized in a table for you with figures and then equations right next to them. So a nice little summation of everything we just talked about in this section, all in one spot. Section 1.6. Mechanics and materials, uh, yeah, gonna need pretty much everything in here as a structural engineer, as a civil engineer, so don't skimp over it. I think what you're getting to see here is chapter one, the takeaway, you're gonna want to study in depth everything they provide in it for you. And a big one as we move through section 1.6, 0.7.2, stresses and beams. All the way at the bottom, I wanna point out, you have your shear flow equation. They only just give a single line with the equation. Uh, do a couple practice problems on that. Shear flow is something really important, and uh, it can be a little tricky, I think, the first couple of times you kinda of tackle it. Composite sections, I know it can be scary at first. Don't skip over it. 
They give you pretty much everything that you need. They give you a little intro. They give you all of your factors. They explain each one, and then they actually give you a figure down below here. So they give you a little bit of meat at least to play with. Um, again, in my opinion, I think you should do a couple examples for composite sections and transforming the sections and everything in between like that. That segues you right into column design 1.6.8. I'm just gonna say yes to everything here. So get into it. I think what they provide is brief, but is very good in terms of what you may be needing to solve a column question on the PE exam. Section 1.7, this is something you will need no matter what. I'm gonna like triple score, underline it because there are no additional books that I brought in to help me for this. Uh, I had my reference manual and in the reference manual, just like this, they had specific information to answer any type of economic engineering question. And they've done the same thing here as I've looked through this. Chapter two, we get into construction. So now from the chapters moving forward, it breaks apart into the different disciplines of civil engineering. That doesn't mean that you can just slash out every single one that doesn't pertain to you. Um, you will want to be using bits of info in every single one of these in order to answer your AM questions. Right off the rip, we have excavation and embankment, which I think is really important. Study this section. Specifically, earthwork volumes, I think is a really important one, both fills and cuts Getting used to that uh, and those example problems, I think you should walk through some of those. And in order to do some of those, you need to understand the equations provided here. So all of this really great info right here. Pay attention to 2.5, material quality control and production. And specifically, it gets into concrete. Um, and they go actually really in depth with concrete and kind of its properties, which is something that's really nice that I didn't see in the structural section. So uh, if you are provided these chapters, uh, utilize them accordingly, because we get into concrete exposure categories in class, something that I use on the day-to-day -day, uh, in, in the professional world. And then right below that, you actually get into concrete cover requirements, and again, something that I think I use daily as a professional, something that I would recommend you study up on and understand because they could be asking you questions. We're out of construction and jumping into chapter three, which is geotechnical. So section 3.1, you get into retained soils, you get into ranking, um, you're talking about your active and passive coefficients, your equations to uh, determine them, definition of variables, figures. That's what I've been looking for as, go as I've been going through this is sections that give you figures, that give you tables, that give you equations and that give you defined variables for those equations and how they all kind of blend together to help you out to understand the concept. That's the stuff that's most beneficial in my opinion. They have multiple figures as you move through here, giving both a passive condition as well as an active condition. You move into retained soils with water tables behind them and um, some of the fancier equations that you get into. Again, great figures that are really needed to help you understand and get these problems right. Now, pay attention to page 83. This is where you have a great table, which gives you all of your friction factors as well as your friction angle of your soil. Uh, page 84, just right after, you have your uniform surcharge equation. That one is one that you can, I don't wanna say definitely have on the exam, but can come up often and I've practice a lot when I was doing all of my practice problems for my studies. We've now skipped down a couple of sections and moved into 3.4. Bearing capacity, this is something, kind of that interaction between geotechnical engineers into the soil and structural engineers with the structure above and the interaction between the two. The lines can get crossed as to who needs to do what in the professional field. So this is an area, although it's in geotechnical, I would highly suggest you understand this section thoroughly, both if you're structural, both if you're geotechnical, and know it kind of well if you're every other discipline. We've jumped once again to Unified Soil Classification Systems, USCS, which is different than AASHTO classification. Those are the two big ones that you're gonna wanna understand when kind of defining your soil class as a potential problem in your exam. Here's a chart you're gonna need right here for USCS. This chart as well, critical to answering those types of questions. And once more, you have another figure to use to work through and uh, determine your group name of your soil class. And lo and behold, right after that, you jump into ASHTO classification system. Same thing, different name, slightly different process, but you have your charts again, you have different classification types, um, but 
just as much a probability as a question being asked on this type of classification system as the USCS system. So you want to know both. All right, hit the brakes. Everybody is gonna need to know section 3.8.3. Weight volume relationship. Here's your figure that we've all seen before. Here's some great equations for unit weight relationship, dry unit weight, saturated unit weight, and then definitions of all the variables and then another really great figure and all of the equations provided to you. This was the same exact information I had in my paper version of my reference manual, and I understood it inside and out for the exam. And yes, I wanna say like 99% chance you will have a problem on your exam that dives into this type of stuff. So know it well. And now ladies and gentlemen, we found ourselves in chapter four, structural. So the main bread and butter of this channel uh, simply put, you're gonna wanna know everything that's going on in this chapter. Sorry, but not sorry. But the weird thing about this chapter is that there's actually not that much information provided to us. Most of the information that you should be drawing from is actually in the codes and provisions that they're also going to be providing to you. Cause that was also a big part of my exam, especially the afternoon for all the structurals out there was I was more in the codes rather than that reference manual. That was more for the AM portion. So. Again, we've talked about chapter one was important, bits of chapter of all the previous chapters prior to that. And I think this is more so a brief overview uh, for everyone who is actually not a structural engineer and just needs the very you know brief topics in order to answer their morning portion of the exam. So that's my takeaway on this because it is very brief, but let's go over and let's see what the great things are in here. If you know this channel well, you know that we come to these all the time. So. I wanna make very much note of it. 4.1.7, moment shear deflection diagrams. Page 252, it then transitions into multi-span members and different unbalanced and balanced loading conditions for that. Something else that's really, really great and something you're not gonna to wanna to skip over that is brief at the end of the tables are your moving load tables. Don't forget about those. Basic welding symbols. This is something, again, pulled straight from your steel manual. Uh, remember that it's here for those of you who aren't taking a steel manual to the exam. Well, you can't anymore, I guess, but who don't have a steel manual available to them, it's right here for you. Right after that, same thing. In your ACI, if that is provided to you, you will have kind of in the back, at least in the paper version, your reinforcing properties for rebar in reinforced concrete. If the ACI is not available to you, it's located in chapter four, right here, 4.3. Crazy enough, you get to the end of section 4.3, and it goes over some brief design equations for a reinforced concrete beam. And they, they define all of your variables, which is really great. One that I do wanna circle here is your modulus of elasticity of concrete. They give you this equation with WC. They define every other freaking variable in the list for all the other equations in this section, except for WC, and WC, is the unit weight of concrete per cubic foot. And uh, you would think most of us out here would think 150 pounds per cubic foot. But in reality, uh, if you were to compare this to another equation in the ACI, which is also known as 57,000 square root F prime C for your modulus of elasticity of concrete, uh, that breaks down to a unit weight of concrete used in this equation of 145 PCF, which is actually a unit weight that is also commonly used. It, I just wanna point that out to all of you. Again, make sure you understand this inside and out. I think this would be the main thing that they would kind of ask you for anyone who's non-structural in the AM portion. Uh, and they give you kind of your associated equations down here to go with that figure. And poof, just like that, you're out of structural and you're into transportation. So for all the structurals, that means wood design, uh, masonry design. Well, I didn't even see steel. <laughs> steel design, all of that is gonna be dictated by the other codes and provisions that will be provided to you electronically. At the very beginning, section 5.1, that gives you many, many different equations for different scenarios for traffic design that are almost always one step equations. So you should at least know how to use the equations if you are given the information. I know that's like, duh, that's like every problem in the PE, but seriously, for these, uh, there's a lot of different criteria and a lot of different scenarios that can seem like it overwhelms you, but most of them are just single line equations with just a few variables that if given 
make sure you are efficient with using and determining which equation you need to use to get a solution. Then we dip down into section 5.2, horizontal design of curves, know this inside and out, and they do the great thing again. They give you your figure, that's one. They give you the definition of all your variables in the figure, that's two. And then right below, they give you all of your associated equations, boom. From horizontal, we move on to vertical curves. Same thing, different curve. Signal design is the next section. I think you're going to run into some example problems in your studies. I know that I did. I don't think it's as critical as the previous, you know, horizontal curves and vertical curves up above but I do think it's something you're gonna to wanna to be aware of and know where it's located. Lastly, we find ourselves in water resources and environmental. I am not gonna pretend like I know what I'm talking about with this chapter. This in my studies was the section that I studied anything and everything because I had no clue what would or would not be on the exam and I didn't know any of it. So I'm not gonna sit here today and walk through this and pretend that like, oh, this is critical. Oh, that's not important. Oh, don't worry about that because that would do a disservice to all of you. What I will do is tell you the things that I just completely ignored um, because I took the chance and said that there's no way this is going to appear in front of my exam as a structural civil engineer. 6.1.5, chemistry, friggin' see you later. 6.7, water quality, eh -eh. wastewater collection and treatment, no. But what about drinking water distribution and treatment? Yes, that one is definitely a, absolutely not, no. Didn't do any of it, just skipped right through it. Didn't even look at a single thing. Let me know down in the comments what you think, what there sections that I missed that you think are critical in order for you to pass, let me know. If you're feeling more confident about the CBT reference manual and you wanna take on a couple practice problems, well, I have dozens and dozens already on the channel where we go through step-by-step -step and get even more confident and prepared for your upcoming PE exam. This is Rich with Team Kesteva, and I'll see everybody next time. Later.